The day after her 10th birthday, Hannah and her father had moved to the small community of Cambridge Bay in the Canadian Arctic. He was working as a radio operator communicating with bush planes that brought in people and supplies to remote Arctic communities. They had arrived on just such a plane two weeks ago following the death of her grandmother. It was a big change from their life on Bowen Island in British Columbia, but one that Hannah had accepted willingly. Hannah's mother had died in childbirth, and grandmother was the only mother she had known. Hannah and her father had found it terribly difficult to adjust to their loss. She still expected grandmother to poke her head around the door to tell her what she was planning for dinner. At her grandmother's funeral, father turned to her and said, We need to spend some time in the Arctic. Grandmother had always loved the outdoors and had published several books on nature photography. She would published one on the Canadian Arctic 30 years ago and talked a lot about returning to witness the effects of climate change. A month before her death, she was planning an Arctic trip for the three of them. She wanted so much to show Hannah the northern lights and the animals and birds of the Arctic. Because of her grandmother, Hannah had developed a keen interest in nature and loved visiting remote wild places. Father had given Hannah her grandmother's camera, and together they planned to produce the sequel to Grandmother's first book on the Arctic. It would be their memorial to Grandmother. Hannah was already a good photographer, as her grandmother had shoved a camera in her hands when she was only five and lovingly taught her how to capture the moment. They were planning to stay for a whole year to witness all the seasons. Little did she know that her great adventure would be elsewhere. Hannah spent much of the day doing homeschooling exercises. For a break, she would lie down on the couch in the room they called the radio shack and listen to her dad talking to the pilots that flew the bush planes. Today, she had been studying the continent of Africa, a part of the world very different from Canada. Many children there have only one meal a day. And, of course, Africa is the home of many exotic animals like lions, elephants, and rhinos. She lay there imagining how different life in Africa might be and wondered if she would visit there someday. Her dad slipped out to make some lunch, leaving Hannah listening to the crackling sound the radio set made when there was no radio traffic. Her dad had explained that the radio waves from his ham radio transmitter could travel all around the globe. As she lay there, she imagined what it would be like if she could travel on a radio beam. And soon, she slipped into a deep dream. In her dream, she felt the radio waves pulling her upwards. Hannah instinctively put out her arms and felt her feet come off the ground as she flew up to the ceiling. It was so cool to float around the room. She even found she could come back to the ground by willing her body back to earth. She was so excited, she went outside where she felt the upward pull even stronger. Again, she raised her arms and was off the ground in a flash. Before she knew it, she was above the roof of her house, and for a while she was able to will her body not to go any higher, as she floated around the neighborhood. She did not feel cold, even though she had not put on her warm jacket, boots, and gloves. Wow. I can take some great pictures with my camera from here. Oh, I've got to show Dad I can fly. On the way back, Hannah floated over the large radio antenna. Suddenly, the radio waves became so strong, Hannah was unable to will her body back to the ground. As she rose higher and higher and higher, Soon she was as high as the bush planes fly. The situation was spiraling rapidly out of her control, but Hannah noticed that she could slow her speed by moving her arms away from her body. Hannah gradually realized that the radio waves were transporting her around the globe. Soon Hannah was so high she could see all across Canada. I must be in space! As the waves carried her off towards Greenland, she discovered she had amazing zoomy eyes. 
Looking down, she could spot polar bears out on the ice sheets and whales in the open sea. Hannah traveled on across the Atlantic Ocean, Europe, the Mediterranean, the Sahara Desert, and on down the great continent of Africa. On the way, she looked down on a huge herd of wildebeest, grazing while migrating to more lush grasslands. With her zoomy eyes, she spied several lions in the grass just outside the herd and guessed the wildebeest were bunched together for protection. Hannah traveled on, finally coming to rest on a hot and barren patch of land with only a few trees and tufts of grass. She heard lots of birds and monkey sounds, but did not see any animals about. Perhaps they were hiding, watching her. She came across a path and followed to see where it led. Along the way, Hannah met a girl collecting some roots. She walked over to the girl and said, Hello! But the girl didn't respond. She tried touching the girl, only to find that her hand passed right through the girl's body. I must be invisible! Does that mean humans and animals can't see me? That bird is flying directly towards me. Oh my gosh, it flew right through me! Hannah decided to follow the girl as she returned to her village. Only her younger sister and brother were home, so the girl set to washing and chopping the roots she had collected. Hannah had never seen anything like that before. Finally, Grandmother arrived carrying a load of sticks on her back. Grandmother, look at the cassava roots I gathered. That is excellent, Ada. Now you can pound them into flour and we can make some cassava bread. The next person to arrive was Ada's mother, who carried the clean laundry on her head and a jug of water in her hand. As Grandmother started cooking the cassava bread over the fire, Ada's father and older brother Darren returned with a smaller herd of only five cows. Normally they herd the cattle all day, trying to find enough grass to feed their animals. Now the grass would no longer support a herd of nine cows, and today they had been to market to sell four of the cows. Knowing that she could not be seen, Hannah joined them around the fire. She sat down on a log next to Ada and listened to the conversation. There was a stick on the ground next to her, and she reached down to pick it up. She could feel the stick as she raised it up, and she was so surprised she dropped it. The sound of the falling stick startled everyone. But Mother said, Oh, it's just a monkey, up to monkey business. Grandmother, who seemed a very wise woman, asked Ada's father, How much did you get for the cows? We could not find a buyer, but we met Cousin Biko and lent the cows to him. But how was Biko going to find grass to feed those cows? Grandmother asked. Normally, when they returned from herding, Father looked very worried. He was afraid the day was soon coming when they would have no cattle. Today he was smiling, and Darren was excited to tell them what they had learned from Uncle Biko. Two years ago, Uncle Biko met a man named Alan Savory. Savory is teaching people how to restore land that is turning to desert, back into healthy grasslands, capable of feeding many more cattle. Uncle Biko agreed to be part of the project. Grandmother said quickly, but we don't have money to buy these fancy grass seeds. That is the good news, Grandmother. We don't need to buy the seeds. They're already in the ground, just waiting for the right conditions to grow, said Father. Like Grandmother, he did not believe the story at first. As part of the project, they took photographs of Biko's land and how it changed. Biko was giving copies to his friends and relatives. Father reached into his pack and brought out some of the pictures. Darren explained. This picture shows what Uncle Biko's land was like at the start of the project. It's just what our land looks like now. This photograph shows what it looked like two years later. Remarkable, said Grandmother. Tomorrow, Grandmother Darren and I will go and visit Biko's community, said Father. And we will see for ourselves. A bus is going to transport people from the market to Biko's. Hannah was watching all this and decided she would go along as well but she wondered where she would sleep tonight. The cattle were placed in the corral for the night with thorn bushes on the outside of the fence to protect against predators. That night, Hannah felt very alone. She was both scared and excited. She heard small animals scurrying about looking for food. She was unable to sleep 
and stirred the coals of the leftover fire with a stick. Before long, a crescent moon came up, bathing the landscape in light. She looked around and noticed a pair of cat-like eyes. It was a leopard! Slowly, the leopard came towards her. Yikes! Maybe it can see or sense me. I'd better stand perfectly still. The leopard walked up and sniffed the end of the stick she was holding. Then, just like a cat, it rubbed the back of its head on the stick and wandered off towards the huts. Hannah's concern for her own safety immediately shifted to the sleeping family. She threw the stick so it landed just in front of the great cat. The leopard leapt in the air and dashed out of the compound. The next morning, they set off walking to the village very early. A large group of villagers were already aboard the bus when they arrived, so Darren and Father had to climb on top of the bus for the ride. A man gave a seat on the bus to Grandmother, and Hannah sat on the same seat. It was weird, but comforting to be sitting inside Grandmother's body. After a bumpy ride, they arrived at Uncle Biko's village. He was there to greet them along with a biologist from the Savory Institute. They were taken out to the community fields where the cattle and goats were grazing and found grass that was as tall as a human. They were all used to seeing cattle with their rib bones sticking out, unlike these that looked so healthy. The visitors were abuzz with questions. Uncle Biko said, It's all about doing what is best for the grass. If you have healthy grass, you will have healthy cattle. Just then, Darren spotted two of their own cows in the herd and showed his grandmother. Soon they'll be nice and fat, he said. The biologist explained that the grazing they were doing was intended to mimic what happens in nature with the huge herds of wildebeest. There the predators cause the animals to concentrate into dense herds for safety. They pee and dung everywhere and are forced to keep moving to avoid eating their own waste. This means that they don't eat the grass again just as it starts to regrow, which would kill the grass roots. I guess the cattle dung is a great fertilizer, which explains why your grass is so tall, said Darren. Hannah recalled the herd of wildebeest she had seen from space. Wow! Isn't nature amazing? The health of the grass depends on the herds and their predators, which in turn depend on the health of the grass. So we need to bunch up our cattle into a smaller area, so that their dung covers much of the ground, said Biko. We only leave them in that area for a day sometimes less, and then move them on. It's important that the ground is left with a good cover of trampled grass to feed the soil microbes that are important for soil health. Just as Hannah was wondering, Darren asked the question, What's a microbe? There are many types of soil microbes, including bacteria, fungi, protozoa, algae, and nematodes, explained the biologist. Each group serves a different function in the soil. For example, bacteria are responsible for converting nitrogen in the air into compounds like ammonium, which are needed by plants. Consider this. There are about as many microbes in a teaspoon of healthy soil as there are people on Earth. That's amazing! I had no idea soil is teeming with microscopic life. In many ways, the soil with its microbes acts like the plant's stomach. The roots of the plant actually make food for the microbes. The microbes, in turn, make available food for the plants, like nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and trace minerals, explained the biologist. We also need to pay very close attention to what is happening to the grass as it regrows. The baby grass grows slowly, followed by a period of rapid growth like a teenager, and finally stops growing altogether. At the end of the teenage phase, the roots below ground are strong, and that is the time to bring the cattle back to graze again. The ground cover provided by the trample grass also reduces the evaporation of soil moisture, Biko explained. And soil with good roots can store a lot more rainfall when it occurs. Just then, the flock of egrets that were following the cattle took to the air, and all eyes turned to look. We get the occasional big cat checking out our herd, said Biko but they aren't normally a problem until nightfall when we put the cattle in the corral. The tall grass attracts plenty of antelope and zebra, so the big cats are not short of their natural prey. In fact, we plan to start a wildlife safari business for visitors as soon as we can buy a Land Rover. Hannah suddenly remembered she could fly. 
She spread her arms and slowly rose off the ground. Fortunately, the radio waves were weak here, so she could control her flight. Once she reached the height of the tallest tree, she used her zoomy eyes and quickly spotted a line in the grass. Gosh, it was very close to the herd. Hannah swooped down and found a stick. She then hovered just above the lion. She wanted so much to touch the beautiful creature, but it looked like the lion might charge the cattle at any moment. Quickly, Hannah dropped the stick in front of the lion. It landed with a clatter as it struck a rock. The visitors heard the sound too and turned just in time to see the lion slink away, followed by a cub that Hannah hadn't noticed. I'm getting pretty good at this. It had been a long day, and all the visitors were excited about the changes they could make back in their own villages. Darren and his father talked about pooling the community cattle into one large herd and collectively grazing them while paying close attention to the life cycle of the grasses. This could ensure beautiful, healthy grass to support healthy cattle. In this condition, their land would support many more animals, both domestic and wild. Hannah had found herself becoming very close to her African family and to the wild creatures they shared the land with. She felt very hopeful about the possibility of healing the earth in this way, while also providing more food and work for many villagers. She had heard that precious rainforests were being cut down to provide more pastures for cattle. Surely it was much better to use cattle to restore degraded grasslands. Suddenly, the sound of the radio static stopped, and Hannah found herself waking up on the couch in her house in the high Arctic. Dad, you'll never believe the dream I just had. I have to write it down before I forget. One third of the Earth's landmass is grasslands, and the desertification of these grasslands leads to soil loss floods, droughts, climate change, famines, and poverty. Here's Hannah to tell us some of the solutions. Savory offers a vision for restoring desertified regions using livestock to emulate the ancient herds of grazing animals together with their natural predators, which were essential for the development of the grasslands in the first place. For thousands of years, we have not been able to deal with nature's complexity. At the heart of Savory's vision is holistic management, a process of planning and decision making that provides the insights and tools needed to work restoratively with nature. These techniques are now being practiced at over 30 Savory hubs on five continents. A new breed of farmers is learning how to tap into the soil's mycorrhizal internet, the Wood Wide Web allowing the soil biology to work for them as it restores carbon in the soil. An elegant symphony of nature is occurring in the soils under our feet. This orchestra of nature is essential for our food security and crucial for my generation.